Okay, hello everyone. I'm sorry if I sound a bit out of breath. Um, I, we just did a talk uh, six minutes ago and uh, had to run from quite far away, so apologies. Um, welcome to um, our talk on the Argo CD end user threat model. Uh, I, my name is James Callahan. I'm a principal consultant at Control Plane and I'm here with my esteemed colleague, Torin. At Control Plane, we are a cloud native security consultancy established in 2017. Uh, we are security specialists in Kubernetes, cloud, and container security, but we do this um, for uh, highly regulated organizations. We're over 50 people now across the UK, Northern Europe, and Australia, Australasia, and we are still expanding. So what will we talk about today? First of all, we'll start off with a quick introduction to what threat modeling is and why it's a good idea to do it. Um, we always think about our scope when we threat model, and it's important to say that this threat model report was first of all commissioned by Linux Foundation, and it's not an audit of the Argo CD project itself. Um, it's not a red team engagement or anything like that. What it is, is focused on end users um, and people deploying Argo CD in, in production. What are we building is the first of four fundamental threat modeling questions that we must ask. So Torin later will give you um, an architecture overview of our sample uh, multi-tenant implementation. Data, of course, is the thing that we care about protecting. It's the heart of threat modeling. Uh, so we need to understand um, our data and um, a, a data dictionary so we can understand the impacts of a compromise of any of those uh, data elements. How do we model it? Uh, we do this through data flow diagrams. This is where we start to catastrophize and ask the question, what can go wrong, and codify these um, catastrophizations in attack trees. Finally, we ask the, um, uh, the question, what are we going to do about it? This is where we devise our recommendations. These are the end user aspects of what you can do to harden our example uh, infrastructure. And then finally, just a note that threat modeling is iterative. We always have to ask ourselves, are we doing a good job? Um, is the threat environment changing? Um, is, are our assumptions sound? And are our controls working? So a threat modeling overview. Threat modeling is a systematic approach we can take to our IT systems where we codify what can go wrong um, and devise mitigations which um, end up reducing risk. So threats can lead to risks, uh, risk can be quantified, and we will always be left with some element of residual risk. It's the purpose of threat modeling to reduce these residual risks in line with something which will be acceptable in our risk uh, management framework and is in line with our risk appetite as, as an organization. Um, it aids in finding and addressing security risks based on attack chains and attack trees, which uh, Torin will show some good examples of later on. Um, and controls, most importantly, will be quantifiable. We can understand the impacts of implementing or not implementing certain controls and communicate this with assurance, compliance teams, um, and ensure that we are within that risk appetite. Finally, most importantly, we can enhance developer retention because people don't spend lots of time re-implementing the same fixes and um, uh, fixing things which are broken, basically. So, why threat model? Because we identify security flaws early on. We should threat model as early as possible, um, but um, uh, any time now is better than um, if you haven't started at the start, now is the best time. We can save time and money, again, um, we uh, don't consume complex uh, redesigns and um, lots of new uh, tickets to fix things which are broken. Um, we identify data flows and uh, complex risks, risks which we might, might miss otherwise. Um, and then finally, yes, we focus security requirements and enhance developer retention. The threat modeling process, we touched on it in the first slide, but we follow a simple four-step uh, process kind of espoused by Adam Shostak and, 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 and co. The first question, what are we building, involves uh, understanding our data, uh, our use cases, our adversaries, and our architecture. So artifacts that can help us here, our data flow diagrams, system architecture diagrams, information flow matrices, all of these things can be put on the table because um, uh, looking at the system from different viewpoints can often elucidate threats which might otherwise be missed. 
What can go wrong is the next step. Um, this is where our little world is, is exploding. We are catastrophizing. We are using threat intelligence sources um, as inspiration. Uh, we can use brainstorming techniques such as Stride uh, to make sure we're not missing any threats. And we can put all of this stuff together in attack trees to see how an attacker would get from um, uh, some level of access or some credentials to actually doing something which uh, matters and um, results in data being compromised. What, we, what will we do about it is the next question, and this is where we devise our controls. Everything, as said before, has to link back to a risk management strategy. We have to devise controls which mitigate our risks within the context of this strategy. Finally, did we do a good job? This is the iterative aspect. We can do things like map controls to attack trees to see if uh, any branches are not covered. Uh, we can write automated tests, which test the, um, not the implementation of a control, but its actual genuine effectiveness in a uh, representative system. And finally, we can revisit our threat model regularly if a threat environment, threat landscape changes. Uh, there are many reasons why we might want to revisit our threat model. In terms of outputs, uh, threats are the key. Threats can be codified in attack paths. Attack paths uh, lead to attack trees, and attack trees are the means for um, devising our controls. And then finally, this is an example of an attack tree, but we won't go through this one in detail. Torin will go through a much more detailed example in a few slides' time. Um, all we will say here is that um, all the attack trees in this report uh, use uh, Deciduous, uh, a tool by Kelly Shortridge. Um, and we can see we can do things like introduce controls, um, so the blue uh, security controls, uh, as indicated here, break, it can possibly break uh, parts of the attack tree and make some paths non-traversable. So attack trees really help with visual visualization. Um, we can annotate nodes to, pro um, to provide extra context. And also we can even quantify things with likelihoods, impacts, and do things which would feed attack trees into uh, an overarching risk assessment. And with that, over to Torin for a bit of project background. Awesome. Thank you very much, James. Um, so to get started here, we need to kind of understand what our scope is and what we're actually trying to threat model here. Um, so for our project, um, kind of like as mentioned by James, we're not doing a security audit or review of the Argo project itself. Um, instead, we are focusing on the end user security considerations for actually deploying and managing Argo CD. Um, and to do this, we have created a uh, sample deployment architecture in multi-tenant mode, um, set up between a operations cluster or ops um, and multiple, in our case, three tenant clusters that it is synchronizing application state to. Um, so, in scope for our project here is um, that uh, architecture that I previously mentioned, as well as the Argo CD interactions uh, with the cluster components um, that it works with directly, and as well the Gitty source control management for actually managing the source repos for each of the applications. Um, out of scope, we are not uh, looking at a security assessment of peripheral K8 components, um, as well as the development and building of the actual applications that are being shipped by Argo CD. Um, for our case, we are setting up the deployment architecture uh, with demo apps, um, but we're not looking actually at the assessment of the applications that are shipped themselves. Um, and on top of that, we're not performing a penetration test or any sort of offsec um, analysis of the system. Um, and we're not looking to provide a hardening guide towards specific data classifications, whether that's PCI, uh, PII, or HIPAA. Um, so what is the, the project overall? So um, for those interested, we have the uh, demo architecture on uh, our public repository, um, although right now it is in a state of becoming open source. Uh, so stay tuned for that in the coming days and week uh, so you guys can actually set up that yourself. Um, but what that architecture looks like is um, Argo CD deployed to a private EKS cluster uh, with an ops cluster that hosts the Argo CD control plane. And I'll kind of get into the architecture specifics um, in a moment, uh, but then is synchronizing to three different tenant clusters within that EKS cluster. Um, so for those interested, feel free once that's open source to try it out and test your hand at deploying it, um, as well as uh, even trying your hand at uh, developing some attack trees and enumerating some threats. Um, so for our threat modeling exercise, um, our uh, 
published uh, report is on the Argo project uh, GitHub repository right now. Um, so feel free to check that out as well if you want to see the detailed run through of not only what we performed as far as security analysts, um, but also the controls and mitigations uh, that we have provided as recommendations uh, for what we found. Um, and for our findings here and the key threats and recommendations, um, we are going to demo some attack trees um, and show how they enumerate some of the threats um, and map them out in a specific exploit chain um, later in this presentation. Um, and those are mapped uh, primarily on critical, high, medium, and low severities um, to provide a risk strategy for actually prioritizing and categorizing them. Um, so a few key assumptions starting here. Uh, tenants are strategically assigned uh, app teams within the same org, and currently, we, uh, for our deployment's sake, we have tenant zero, tenant one, and tenant two um, to simulate the multi-tenant mode deployment of Argo CD. Um, and the Argo CD deployment itself is deployed using Terraform modules, um, and Argo CD is running uh, its control plane on the ops cluster and is synchronizing state to the tenant clusters, but is not actually installed on the tenant clusters themselves. Um, it is uh, maintaining a synchronization between the ops cluster um, and the Giti source control for those repos. Um, for repository organization, um, we have a Giti server hosted on the ops cluster itself, and we have one CD repository per application team uh, with separate folder for the manifest stored within that repository itself. Um, for the synchronization process, um, we have autosync set up for each of the tenants, and that is triggered uh, based on commits to the main. Um, so whenever commits are being put to the main repository of each of those app repos uh, hosted on Giti, um, then autosync will be triggered and then pushed downstream to each of our tenant clusters to update um, and to synchronize that state. Um, so what are we building here? Uh, let's look a little into the architecture that we're working with before we can actually understand the scope um, and to see how we threat modeled uh, our system. So, as I mentioned previously, we are deploying this on an AWS EKS cluster, um, which is, or is hosted in a virtual private cloud. Um, as far as access is concerned, and if you run through the demo itself, uh, you'll be able to SSH through a secure Bastion host that actually allows you to issue uh, commands uh, from your local machine, whether that's through the API directly or through kubectl, um, to interface with the clusters to see what's going on and to investigate. Um, for the setup, um, we have, uh, as I mentioned, we have three different tenant clusters with tenant cluster one, two, and three, um, which are being synchronized up to the ops cluster itself, which holds uh, not only Argo CD control plane, but also the Giti server for source control management, where we actually are storing the application repositories themselves. Um, so in multi-tenant mode, um, and as many of you may be familiar with in deploying Argo CD, um, we have set it up between our three tenants um, and running the tenants as app project resources um, and the applications as the application resource in Argo CD. Um, so I provided a sample um, of the actual app project and the application resource manifests, um, and you can see how we're actually setting the destinations here. So in the app project itself, the destination of the tenant zero cluster and all namespaces providing Argo CD with cluster-wide access um, to synchronizing the state of those applications. Um, in our other clusters, so in tenant two and tenant three, um, those are actually being synchronized at, uh, or sorry, in tenant one and tenant two, those are being synchronized on namespace level only and not cluster-wide. Um, and you can also see the uh, selection of the source repos that we're actually using and creating in Giti. Um, and when you run through the demo, you can create these over the UI or create them through CLI commands, uh, which, whichever way you prefer. Um, and they are linked uh, through the application itself, um, defining which ones are, should be synchronized to each application. Um, so an overview of what this looks like, and many of you might be intimately familiar with the, the UI offered by Argo CD, um, but you'll see that we have our app one, two, three, and four um, applications, uh, each of them healthy and synchronized um, to the ops cluster itself and the Argo CD control plane hosted within it. Um, and here you'll be able to update uh, and configure the manifests and the configuration for the apps as well as the app projects itself um, to play around with the demo itself. Um, so we need to, after we kind of understand the architecture overview, um, we need to understand what our critical data assets are, right? Um, so what we are actually concerned with protecting um, and what a uh, simulated attacker or malicious threat actor might be interested in compromising. Um, so to do this, we create what is called a data dictionary, um, which is essentially acts as a blueprint of your critical data assets. Um, so 
to model your dictionary, you need to answer a few questions. Um, so what data is crucial to your system functionality? Uh, what data or secrets are used to secure your system? Uh, this could, in many cases, by default, it's Kubernetes secrets um, or some sort of API token. Um, and then what data, if misused, could alter um, or disrupt the system itself? Um, all important questions in their own right that uh, allow you to fine tune and focus on the actual critical data assets um, that are pertinent to your system, in our case, to Argo CD and GitT uh, synchronizing app state. Um, so once you identify this, you can then begin to categorize um, each of the identified assets. In our case, we use the RAG approach, or the red, amber, green, um, which associates uh, red with high, and then uh, amber with medium, and then green with low risk levels for our data assets. Um, this is not the only approach, uh, but this is the approach that we took for this threat model exercise. Um, so, I'll do kind of a quick run through this, but for those interested, uh, there is a, a detailed run through on the uh, Argo project um, end user threat model report that you can find that runs through each of these. Um, but these are some of the enumerated critical data assets for Argo CD. Um, so for example, the Kubernetes service count token for Argo CD, as well as the init um, admin password for actually setting up uh, different users and configuring Argo CD from startup. Um, and we also, we enumerate you know, local user credentials where people are actually accessing um, and manipulating the application applications and app projects within Argo CD. Um, and then we assign them their RAG classification or their high, medium, and low risk priority. Um, and we put that against the CIA triad, right? So the uh, impact of confidentiality, integrity, and availability of end user data um, is then mapped to our RAG um, approach, which is put into our data dictionary and allows us to begin the threat modeling exercise um, and start moving into attack trees. Um, but before we actually touch into attack trees themselves, um, we need to still kind of model how data procedurally moves through the system. Um, and to do this, we create data flow diagrams. Um, and this acts or answers the next question of how you model your system. Um, and to begin, you want to start with an architecture overview, but once you understand the system you're actually creating and modeling, um, then you need to understand how data is actually moving and flowing through it. So to do this, we've created two levels of uh, increasing granularity of the system itself. Um, and you'll notice that um, the dotted green line that moves between the system itself is denoting the trust boundaries, right? Um, so the namespace trust boundaries and as well as the cluster trust boundaries um, that need to be transcended for data to move in and out of your system and interact with the different components, as well as in our case to interact and synchronize with the downstream applications. Um, so here we have our Argo CD hosted in the Argo CD namespace and GitT in the GitT namespace, both within the operations cluster. And to move out of the cluster itself, you need to transcend first the namespace and then cluster trust boundaries um, to synchronize to each of the tenant clusters, which we'll see in the next data flow diagram. Um, so level one gets a little bit more granular. Um, so it shows each of the components as well and how they are operating within Argo CD um, and the tenant clusters, right? Um, so after transcending the operations cluster boundary, um, then the auto sync will trigger into each of the tenant clusters. In the case of tenant cluster one, that is cluster wide, right? So Argo CD has access to the entire cluster and is able to synchronize across namespaces, in our case with app one and app two namespaces. Um, tenants uh, one, or sorry, tenants, yeah, tenant two and tenant three, um, those are namespace scoped. Um, so it's two specific namespaces. In our case, for application three and application four is what Argo City actually has permission and is directed to synchronize. Um, so once we understand how data is moving in our system, we understand our architecture overview, we can get into the catastrophization, kind of as uh, James had mentioned, with creating attack trees. Um, so what can go wrong? What is our doomsday scenarios? So what is a potential threat actor looking to exploit in our system? Um, so to begin, I'm going to give a, uh, one of our, our larger uh, threat model uh, attack trees for this specific use case, um, which maps out four uh, or five uh, high priority threats in our case um, in different out of the box configuration, as well as different threats that we've enumerated from this threat modeling exercise. Um, and a key note before I kind of get into one of the specific uh, attack chains here um, is the reality step, right? So you start at the left-hand side here of the reality where the attacker is, and typically you'll, you'll break this out into an external and internal attacker. Um, internal might look something like your infrastructure provider or your cluster operator or system administrator, uh, whereas external attacker is someone uh, outward looking in on your system itself. Um, but 
there's a lot going on here, right? Um, so we are going to break this down into a specific attack chain and see how an external attacker um, might move through the system. Um, so from an external uh, attacker's standpoint, um, they are looking at an eventual takeover of a tenant cluster um, on our simulated infrastructure. Um, so to begin to do that, um, they first need to enumerate some credentials. Um, and a critical asset to doing that um, is the Argo CD service account token um, to be able to uh, maliciously configure um, or otherwise enumerate the secrets within Argo CD's deployment itself. Um, so moving from the chain, um, you can see that uh, after the attacker first enumerates the kubeconfig credentials, um, they need somehow to access the secure bastion host, right? Um, that might look like socially engineering um, a developer to get their credentials uh, to SSH into the system itself uh, or some sort of phishing effort. Um, and once they do that, they then can access the network itself um, and can begin to issue malicious commands on your tenant clusters. Um, so. At this stage, um, the attacker has cluster admin permissions. Uh, so after lifting the kubeconfig credentials and being able to steal the SSH credentials of, in this case, the app developer, um, they then can move further and transcend your trust boundaries in your system um, and now are operating on your ops cluster. Um, and from here, they will look to maliciously uh, configure your downstream tenants and try, in our case, to deploy a malicious deployment to those tenant clusters. Um, so. Once the service account, or service account token is compromised, um, sensitive information about the Argo CD deployment can be enumerated. Um, this looks like something like the init password, which is not deleted by default, but is suggested so by the project, um, as well as other secrets um, and tokens stored on your clusters. Um, so from here, the um, attackers now have cluster-wide access, right? So then they can move from your ops cluster into your downstream tenant clusters um, and begin to attempt a malicious deployment into your tenant clusters. Um, so in this case, the end goal for the attacker um, is a full cluster takeover, which is possible through the steps that we've kind of outlined and ran through here. Um, after reading the cluster-wide um, <clears throat> secrets enumerated on the ops cluster, then they can move and transcend to the tenant cluster itself. Um, so this is a, a larger example of a mapping of a few of our high party threats, but I'm going to look um, after this into a, a more granular uh, focus on one of our other attack trees. Um, so this attack tree looks at the tenant cluster takeover um, due to the uh, unrestricted default project of Argo CD. Um, so starting out, uh, you have your reality, right? Um, and from reality, the, um, the attacker can then uh, begin to enumerate some of the initial passwords, and specifically the initial admin password of Argo CD, um, to maliciously configure um, Argo CD. Um, and I, I see we're running a little bit or low on minutes. Uh, so I, I will kind of glance over this one, and then we'll look at some of the security threats and recommendations that we've enumerated off of this. Um, so what can we do about it? Um, so what are our controls? What are our mitigations that come from this threat modeling exercise? Um, so some security threats and rec considerations follow a few key questions here, right? So who can access or um, who can Argo CD access? Um, in this case, looking at uh, giving Argo CD namespace specific or namespace scope access as opposed to cluster wide access um, and limiting the permission of service account tokens um, in Argo CD's deployment itself. Um, as well as using workload identity, this could look something like Spiffy Inspire, and there's a lot of other implementations as well, um, to connect to the tenant clusters themselves securely. Um, and on the second question, who can actually uh, access Argo CD? Um, so this kind of gets into our multi tenant deployment, um, as well as disabling some of the out-of-box configurations. Um, specifically, the local admin user that's actually created uh, with admin level access to Argo CD to create other users and modify your app project and application resources um, to protect the credentials themselves using uh, an external key management uh, service and then using SSO to enforce MFA if it is uh, applicable and is not overkill in your use case. Um, as well as limiting user accounts based on RBAC. Uh, this can be done natively through Kubernetes as well in our demo deployment. Um, and then finally, how does Argo CD actually manage applications? Uh, so in our case, app projects and application sets. Uh, de uh, the first recommendation here is actually deleting the default uh, Argo CD project, um, as it has a lot of insecure out-of-the-box configurations that are very useful for setting up, but should be um, deleted and at least controlled uh, if it is not deleted to begin with. 
um, as well as limiting the repos and clusters that app projects can manage um, to limit the blast radius of an attack if it were to be realized. Um, and finally, admins of whether that's an application admin or a system administrator themselves should be the only ones to actually manage your application sets. Um, this kind of gets into the principle of least privilege uh, here at the end. So there's a few uh, high priority findings, given we're kind of short on time here, I won't run through each one of them, but you are more than encouraged to check out the uh, Argo CD end user threat model report on the Argo project repository. Um, and it will go through each one of these and kind of give you some recommendation strategies on them. Um, so to the last question on how can we improve, um, and we need to first kind of understand, did we do a good job to iteratively approve, right? Um, so through the exercise that we performed on Argo CD, we enumerated 19 threats, six of them being high priority based on the stride approach, um, and provided recommendations and mitigation strategies for each of them. And key to note here is the actual mapping of the high priority threats on our two attack trees and implementing controls to break those attack chains. Um, so a quick thank you to the Linux Foundation and the Intuit team for helping us with this, and uh, thank you everyone for listening in.